Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 80 of the Titan Forge podcast. I'm Dratnos, joined by Tettles. Hello, what's up? Good afternoon. And Trell. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, this week, we are continuing with our Wednesday, Thursday schedule, which we'll be on probably for the next month or so, month, month and a half, two, two months, something like that. Uh, not... Something like that. Yeah. Whenever MBI is over ish. Having something that it seems like I probably should know, uh, but in fact, don't know quite as much as I, it just, as I should. I don't know. It ends whatever it ends. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Um, Dredus so, and I just show up on every other weekend, alternating weekends to cast the MDI. We don't really know. What it's not also. Is. There's going to be a two weekend break between this coming cup though and the one after because there's BlizzCon Line, where uh, I'm pretty excited for that because I, I think we should get to see probably not just 9.1 but 9.2 spoilers if I had to guess because I think we got 8.1 and 8.2 spoilers at the uh, at the BlizzCon oh, really? two years ago. I think yeah. I'm not 100 percent sure so. It's going to be a mystery. It's going to be an exciting mystery that gets solved for us. Um, yeah, I have to shake my head every time I hear the word BlizzCon line. It's just... Yeah. They... Yeah, yeah. It's like a bad dad joke. <laughs> it's a really bad dad joke, I agree. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm, I'm right there with you, but... I, it's like... It's it's the official name of the thing. It's not even like a... Like, people are just shortening that. It's actually what it's no, called. They actually named it BlizzCon Line, yes. Yep. Um, so, that's coming soon. We'll, we'll obviously talk about that. This week, we are going to do a little bit of a, a theory episode. Uh, so, this mm -hmm. one's going to be about kiting as a tank uh, and how to help your tank kite as not a tank in a dungeon, generally. Um, there's a little bit of raid relevance here as well, but mostly be dungeon focused. Although, this tier, there's actually been quite a bit of tanking uh, or kiting as a tank. Uh, compared to an average tier, I would say. Well, I mean, there's a lot of mobs that are like... I feel like this tier, more than in the past, there have been like a lot of tank mechanics that literally could just be outranged with Infernal Strike. Or like, okay, so Stone Legion Generals and Council of Blood are probably the ones that come to mind the most. Where it's just, you literally leap away from the mechanic, the mechanic doesn't hit you, and it, like, uh, it, it doesn't happen and you're like okay yeah well, this is kind of weird the stone legion generals is more just like you're ranging something it's really council of blood that has an actual kite on it uh where mm -hmm. you are there is that the ad that you kite in the last phase um but that's pr that's pretty rare it's pretty rare that a raid tier features that as like an actual uh strategy that, that everybody uses kiting kiting as a tank in raid is usually like the boss is at two percent and you need to kill it and you know 10 people are alive and yeah uh you're no, trying to kite the last little bit yeah i have a question enraged. So I heard this, uh, I read this in your Discord, Dratnos, but can you confirm that the reason that you've been streaming a lot less lately is because you made uh, $500,000 off of uh, GameStop stock? <laughs> no, that's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd been smart enough to buy GameStop at 40 bucks or whatever, but... Uh... <laughs> whatever Jack was telling us about it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would have been, that would have been pretty good. What's that right now? It's back down, right? Yeah, it's, it's down to $92 now, know, so it's, yeah. uh, the bubble has, has really burst on that. I love I love the meme of Dratnus doesn't stream much anymore because he made so much money off of GameStop stock that he never has to press go live anymore. It's uh it's Dogecoin actually. I'm a, a Dogecoin investor. <laughs> that's you made all your money. I see. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's what I've been up to. Uh, how about you, Tettles? How's your how's your last couple of days been going? Uh, it's been going okay. I've been making some more consistent YouTube videos. Been doing that EU pugging series stuff. I think that the first video of the series went okay, but I think that I want to make them longer in the future. I think that that's better long form content. I understand that uh, your guild has has taken down Sire as well. Ooh, yes, we got Sire. We actually got Hall of Fame too because there were only ninety six guilds going into uh, reset on the Horde side that had uh, Hall of Fame. So now Trell and my guild are probably both getting Hall of Fame. I would I would suspect that in a sense is getting it right. I would sure hope so. They should kill tonight. <laughs> yeah, and if not tonight, then Monday. How about you, Trell? Has it has it been going for you? How you've been recovering nicely? All all back up to uh back up to speed. Yeah, I'm actually I'm actually like probably eighty five percent back to normal. I think. I mean, it's it's it was pretty major surgery, so it's gonna be a while, but that's good. I can move around and do all my normal stuff for the most part. Have uh, either of you been playing this push week that has just started? And also, how would you guys rate this week compared to some of the other you know good fortified weeks on the calendar? I haven't been playing it much, but okay, so basically this week is, I, I would say it is like the, the, 
the third best fortified week, maybe fourth best fortified week. And it's not a bad week in terms of like uh, completing dungeons. It's not like hard. There's no grievous. There's no um, some of those more like difficult to deal with the fixes. But it's like annoying and slow because of storming and inspiring, mostly inspiring because they're like packs in a couple of dungeons, uh, like Theater of Pain being a prime example of it, where it's just like the mobs. The inspired mobs themselves are so difficult to be able to deal with just generally. Um, and then there are obviously sometimes like Halls of Atonement, which are literally free. Like, I, I do not think that there is a bad inspiring mob in Halls of Atonement. So it's it's definitely good for some dungeons. It's really bad for some dungeons. I think that overall, I, I would say it is a push week. It's not the best, though. Yeah, um, I think I'm inclined to agree there. It's, it's tough because it's the only uh, storming fortified week. And feels like storming should be a good push week affix generally for like the triple ranged comps. Yeah. But yeah, inspiring does throw a bit of a wrench in, in a lot of dungeons. Y yeah. I mean, th even the spiteful week, uh, the spiteful week wasn't even that bad because, like you said, triple range comps, a lot of people are also playing like Windwalker or Rogue. Yeah, it's true. So, so the easily deal with spiteful, but the sp the spiteful week was, I think, definitely easier than than the inspiring week because the inspiring is the hardest to fix. Yeah, it's too. inspiring versus volcanic on the on the other the non melee exactly. unfriendly affix row. I, I do think looking at this calendar, it has to be bursting volcanic that uh <laughs> that gets the, that the, the nod. Yeah, that one's uh <laughs> I think orders of magnitude easier. Like maybe multiple key uh key dungeon levels higher easier i got i don't know what i'm going to do for my wildhead article series once we reach that week because literally everything is just there, is there a level above s tier like i don't i don't understand what i'm going to do anymore all right th this kind of segues into a discussion a little bit out of order but uh yolo let's 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 do it this way because there there's an interesting change that's coming to the affixes that will start we'll start feeling it next week which is too tyrannical uh, so tyrannical is now is has been just nerfed by ten percent, right? Ten percent on uh, on the health bonus, so down to thirty from forty. Yeah. Uh, do either of you think that this might make tyrannical weeks? H how much do you think this brings them into line here? I think it'll bring them more into line. I'm not sure exactly because, like, you do you do gain a lot of time in the dungeon by not fighting fortified trash but everybody has to relearn cooldown so it might be a long time before we see the real impact of this nerf because dungeons are quite different when all the trash dies faster and all the bosses take a little longer still i think that it's not even i i don't even think one of the biggest issues is the tyrannical like nerf itself i don't think it's going to cause any more problems i think the problem is the bosses like now thor hakar zav all of them summon like these ads all of them uh like shield or like shield themselves and have these yeah. problems where you have to like focus down an ad or like kill through a shield and it's just like all right well this is really problematic uh, the longer the fight goes and it's just the age-old tyrannical issue of the fight doesn't just get 30 percent longer because it has 30 percent more health it gets exponentially longer because it has 30 percent more health and right even even if there was no mechanic even just if you're fighting a target dummy that gets 30 percent more health the fight gains more than 30 percent longer because mm -hmm. you're spending like you you only have the same amount of cooldowns right I, um but am... especially it gets longer whenever there is a shield phase or ads that get summoned mm -hmm. anything like that that uh, really slows you down further i similar or to it might make you oh sorry sorry good Okay. Uh, yeah, I was like, I'm in I'm interested to see similar to trial, like how it's going to actually feel because a nerf from 40 to 30 percent is actually a pretty massive buff. And if you could kill trash fast enough to be able to kind of offset the time differential on some of these more problematic bosses, I I think it could bring it more in line. I don't think it'll be like a great like set, but I, I do think it'll be more in line. Also, tyrannical fixes really suck this season. Like tyrannical bosses that are really, really rough also affect the pulls before and after them too, because you got to hold more CDs. Mm -hmm. You got to worry about a lot of like just so many more factors going into the boss that you wouldn't normally have to deal with on fortified. Like say Hakar, you need like every cooldown on demand to, to do Hakar on a high tyrannical key, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't really blow everything on the pride like you would before, and maybe the pride is now the problem as well as the longer boss fight. So there's yeah. just so many things that fortified versus tyrannical changes in a dungeon. And so even though you could actually do the, the, the stuff as well, you, you're losing so much efficiency as well by trying to actually make the bosses, you know, actually completable. Well, I, I, I don't want to overstate or understate just how big this is, though. I mean, this is it's yeah. a quarter of the affix has been 
lopped off. That's quite a large impact. It is um, very big, yeah. Tettles, you it's mentioned that the other affixes that accompany tyrannical are often more <laughs> harsh. I, I think I'm inclined to agree with that. Uh, yes. There's really not very many weeks. Like, if, if you ignored this first row and you were just looking at the level four and level seven rows, almost all of the, the best combinations are next to a fortified already. There's some stuff here. I think, like, raging, quaking tyrannical uh, is one that looks like a, a pretty pretty solid contender for playable week bursting explosive mm -hmm. uh i think also probably up there uh, but a lot of this stuff that, that is next to tyrannical you know bolstering necrotic inspiring necrotic bolstering storming uh those are it's all just like bolstering it's shit that slows you down you're like all right never mind i can't play this yeah anyways. so th there's there's two explosive weeks raging explosive and bursting explosive and then raging quaking i think those are the three best tyrannical contenders from the list I think that, I think that the... raging one is probably pretty solid. The raging quaking one. You guys want to do some twenties on bolstering necrotic tyrannical? <laughs> Dude, what the fuck was that last week? That was actually so bad. <laughs> it's actually just one like one of those affixes out, and it would still be a hard week. Yeah, this this week compare this to fortified bursting volcanic. <laughs> is uh... a <laughs> ah yes, very fair. This is like doing uh, th that's like doing Legion dungeons in our current gear versus uh, doing Shadowlands dungeons. It's What's the difference. I don't know. I mean, th <laughs> there was like really good push weeks during BFA on Tyrannical. There was that. It was bursting quaking, or was it bursting volcano? I don't know. There was like a really good Tyrannical week in BFA. Not not exactly that many now. Uh, teaming teaming volcanic. Yeah, teaming uh, volcanic. Team, teaming volcanic. That's what it was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which was it was not bad, although it was something terrible. that was silly. Yeah. All right, let's uh, let's do the other stuff in this hot fix now, and then we'll we'll, so we'll we're doing this in a slightly different order. But uh, accompanying the tyrannical nerf, we also had several nerfs to mob, generally tank buster mobs, and how they bust your tanks have been reduced by quite a bit. <laughs> uh, so you have mobs like the start of the mechagon section and the other side, the dress soul cleavers and mists. Uh, the Chamber Sentinels in Sanguine Depths and the Frenzied Ghouls, uh, the Ether Divers, all these sorts of things, the Bone bone Carvers, where the Bone Carvers, actually, it's kind of unclear how big of a nerf this is because it was being reduced by armor and now it isn't. So uh, even though it's this big 70% number, there's a good chance this is doing about the same damage as it was before. That bleed was being reduced by armor? Yeah. That... Know that. <laughs> That's really funny. Dude, bleeds are wild. Bleeds have, like, no it's... rule set. They just do something random. They're, yeah, Side they're... Note. Any physical thought is supposed to ignore armor, but this one wasn't. Yeah. Dude, Necrotic Wake, actually just monumentally easier now I, after the changes. to Last the... week's as well. Every fucking mob got yeah. nerfed. <laughs> Which I think was good. It, it, it's just a tough, it, it's a tough balancing act for them to do because with dungeons like Necrotic Wake and Plaguefall, where the dungeon does itself for you if you play it right, it's really hard mm. to land a, a balance that scales with the key level and, and the group's coordination as well as a dungeon that doesn't do that kind of stuff. We talked about that last week. Um, yeah. In general, though, I think that... So the, their stated reasoning behind the, all these changes was, we've noticed tanks in Mythic Keystone dungeons feeling pressured to spend more time running away and less time actually tanking than we'd like. <laughs> in an effort to address this, we are dialing back the tank damage of a number of dungeon denizens who've proven to be particularly powerful, or particularly painful, rather. Dude, okay, so can you imagine if instead they just, like, slap... They're like... Yeah, every single dungeon and uh, every single mob in all the dungeons now just does ten percent less damage with white swings. That would that would have been my preferred. That would have uh, been a better fix. Way yeah. to do yeah. this, yeah. Because um, I think it is just the the intensity of the auto attacks that is it is really think, threatening. And this is a classic Blizzard problem. Like they identify a problem finally like this, and then they implement the wrong solution. The solution is to make all six tank classes able to do these dungeons, especially on fifteen, without having to kite. Like, that's where they should be every season, and the, they have been every season up until now. Maybe not season one of BFA, but uh, if, you can, if you're can, if you a full Mythic geared tank, you should definitely not have to kite in a 15. Like, let's all be honest, we agree with that, right? Yeah, but, it, it, it's wild, because, like, even as a fully Mythic geared tank in a 15, like, there are pulls you have to kite in, uh, in, most, in many dungeons, yeah. Well, yeah, there's a lot of bleed. I mean, there's like a decent amount of bleeds. There are mobs like the Gargons and the Bone Right, which were untouched players. in Halls of Atonement because I think that they just, Halls of Atonement is, has such good completion numbers, but like that, there are still well, five pulls you have to kite in that dungeon. Yeah, I, I mean, the for what it's worth, the Gargons too are like, the reason that they don't have anti-kites and like shit like that is they're made to be kited. I'm pretty sure those packs are like intended to be kited. Maybe. Um, Maybe, yeah. 
but like even even just normal pulls on the other side i i've seen fully geared mythic prot warriors for example having to kite when they run out of shield block you know it's like the amount of damage coming in from white swings should not outweigh the mitigation patterns of tanks in a 15. and i think uh, myself and many other experienced mythic plus tank players are just good tank players in general that are raiders agree that the auto swings are just way more powerful than they've ever been and to be fair so here was, they have targeted several of those white swings but it's only on these specific mobs it's not like across the board right uh it's just like like some mobs are, are doing less less with their autos um, yeah but mostly it's 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 the actual tank buster mechanics which uh, um. have gotten nerfed Wretched Phlegm, which is the Plague Boar thing, yeah. too, also got hit. It's not it's not on that blue post, but they came back, like, a few hours later, they're like, yeah, never mind, this also needs to be nerfed, too. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if that was uh, Squishy's... Squishy tweeted, I think, right after uh, this list came out, that the that those should be included. Oh, yeah, they should because they should have been. That's, like, absolutely yeah. true. The, the Wretched Phlegm from the Plague Boars does way too much damage. They should have also oh, probably yeah. hit the Plague Rocks, I think, but... Yeah, I was, I was thinking Plague Rocks as well. Plague Rock is literally a mob that they had to, like remove one from the dungeon because it was causing it was so many problems people. yeah two of them yeah um so <laughs> i forgot about that yeah, yeah these changes were good though at least something was done like right. a lot of these tank busters were one-shotting even the all-powerful demon hunter and other tanks they're just like killing twice and, and one shot you know yeah anytime so, my <laughs> last resort procs on my demon hunter i'm just thinking what what were you supposed to do on this as a paladin <laughs> okay <laughs> what about what, what about after your last here? resort and your Sun King Trinket. What about after both of those proc? I, I AFK for eight minutes. I, I tell my group, all right, look, yeah. we're, we're, we've had enough for a while. You know, go make yourself a coffee or whatever. Break time. <laughs> we're, I put up a break timer. We come back when they're ready again. Um, I don't know of any Demon Hunters who do it any other way. Uh, anyways, <laughs> in addition to these changes, let's also, I guess, because this does tie in as well, we can talk a little bit about the uh, class balancing changes that came in too. Uh, so several classes got hit with the old five percenter, the old three percenter. Um, in a couple of cases, they made some PvP adjustments to. Th so these were PVE oriented changes, and then in in like the Frosty K case, they didn't want to make them too OP in PvP, so they hit Chill Streak while buffing all abilities. Um, some specs in here, you know, like our Arms, for instance, uh, is getting a little buff, but people are worried about being really good in uh, in PvP, so they Dude, you know there's you know a little PvP talent nerf, I guess, in there. You know, that's funny, though. I, I find it so silly that, like, Arms and Fury are getting buffed, too, because, like, you're still bringing one of those to every single fight, and then if you factor in how much value they get out of Battle Shout, it's like a, they're already doing, like, effectively an unreal amount of damage. But I think the problem with, like, buffs is the fact that it can be on tanks, too. Yeah, I mean, it's, this is just a problem where any spec is bringing, like, 3% of the raid's damage. By by yeah. having Battle Shout, by having Chaos Brand, by having Mystic Touch, like how do you make it so that, uh, or how 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 do you have a, a balanced system where multiple warriors can potentially be good when you are always required to bring one, right? Like that, it's so it's so tough to balance around representation exactly. that way when you know there's 36 specs and 20 Mythic Raid slots. One of those 20 slots is always going to a warrior, right? And so like regardless of how much damage they're doing, there's always that one warrior in there. Um, but you also yeah, want true. them to feel okay on the damage meters. But then if they're like good on the damage meters and good on and and bring that buff, and then there's specs out there that are just like that, you know, sad in the rain, feral yeah. druid or whatever, enhancement shaman, just looking and like, why, why do they get damage and buff? Well, part of the problem <laughs> too is that like, prot warrior, uh, at least for like arms and fury, is that like prot warrior, vengeance, and brewmaster also all bring the buffs that are necess mm -hmm. like necessities, and so basically you're going to bring two buff tanks. And I mean, this is the problem with the system is you're going to bring two buff tanks and then pick the best out of those uh, three, like the best DPS out of those three. And like infrequently, are you going to stack them unless of course one of them is exceptionally strong? Yeah, you basically have this checklist and we, we talked about this in our episode with tags um, where you, you go into the tier, right? And you have like, okay, we need one paladin for Devo Aura. We need one monk. We need one warrior. We need a warlock, obviously. Um, we need a demon hunter, right? What are going to be the best ways to solve to solve these problems, right? So rather than having like twenty raid slots that specs can compete for, there are several specs out there that are only competing for like one of four sp uh, slots that's left over after you finish yeah. you know, picking all and the OP specs and all the specs that check those boxes. 
And, that... and, and I also think it reduces tank diversity by a significant amount because of it too, because it, it, it kind of locks you straight into a comp for almost the whole tier. Like the you're not you're not gonna see like blood decay or prop paladin in that much because of this, yeah, right? Guardian as well. Like Guardian, the fact that Boomkin gets roar now uh <laughs> basically kills Guardian's yeah, true. You know, claim to being <laughs> a, a tank that gets brought, right? You remember Kill Jaden, people brought Guardians because they had some beating roar. Well, you know, you get your Stampeding Roar from your Groomkins now. You don't You don't need... There's no Feral or Guardian thing that, that gets brought. So it's tough when you have, like, eight or nine specs out of the 36 that bring something like that, and then 20 or so specs that are just sitting there with nothing and uh, are, you know, th th there's so few spots left for them after. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, I've I've talked about this before, but I I think that this, this is not a good equilibrium that we're in right now. I agree with that. It's, it's especially bad right now because... Havoc and Arms and Fury have been slightly low on the damage meters, you know. So it's yeah. like it really exaggerates the problem where Vengeance and Pro Warrior were like the go to picks. Now, a lot of and people. And is really squishy too. So, like, you want a Windwalker over it for sure. Because also, Windwalker does a ton of damage. A lot of people look at the changes here, like the Havoc getting the 3% buff, and they're like, this, is, this doesn't solve the problem with the spec, right? Uh, the spec needs, it doesn't need any help in AoE, it just needs help on single target. Um, yep. I, I'm inclined to agree that like m almost every spec, there are good ways to fix it that aren't just giving them aura buffs. But if you're going to do balancing like mid-patch, frequent balancing mid-patch, which people want, which I think I want, yes. I think you got to accept that like, okay, look, between the patches, you're probably just going to see small percentage adjustments, right? And then during the patches, that's when you can come in well, and say, all right, look, we're changing some core functionality of, uh, you know, how Blade Dance works, how the talents, how the talent rows look. I would argue this is a byproduct of, like, the the implementation of, like, these aura buffs and nerfs and, like, the implementation of the tuning knobs, like you said. It's like before, I feel like the developers were at least a little bit more willing to try to make active choices uh, as to, like, address the problems of, like, where the spec is being lackluster and to try to address, like, what is actually happening with the spec. But now they'll just hit you with the aura buff uh, if, if they see your spec is underperforming. And, and it's just a band-aid to a much greater issue a lot of times granted and, and for what it's worth most people only care about damage though so i, I think though that my my like i, I certainly am, am ready to describe these as band-aid fixes but i think that band-aids are good to you know if you've got a if you've got a spec that's bleeding you know slap a band-aid on it until you get to the next <laughs> patch right uh it seems, it seems like a, a good a good solution to me um until you know until we get to a new patch rather than there have been a lot of patches in wow's history where just no balancing has come in at all and this is the second or third round of you know these these three to five percent adjustments that some specs have gotten uh including some specs now getting hit multiple times and i, I think that this is a really good way to make it so that it's less punishing to beat like it's it's not going to change which of these specs are the right and wrong specs to be playing if that's the kind of content you're doing where there is right and wrong specs um, but it's going to make it a lot less hurtful to be one of the wrong specs, especially in the kinds of content where yeah. you're you're playing and you don't want to be choosing based on that, right? If you're in a guild where you just want to play Survival Hunter and, you know, that's the spec you enjoy, it's really nice to see your, your numbers get tuned up and it's not necessarily going to fix all the problems with the spec or anything, but it makes it less bad to be on that. Uh, it makes it less uh, less of a bad experience in Raid when you're just sitting at the bottom of meters every night, right? Um, so I, I think that Band-Aids are a... a uh, frequent band-aids between patches people are comparing that with like perfect adjustments to spells but what they should be comparing it with is nothing because i think that's the alternative is if, if we'd either get yeah. this or nothing i think this is a lot better Take than what we can get. Yeah. yeah that's true uh, okay let's talk a little bit about the mdi uh, because we have that coming up this weekend as well and then we will do tip of the week and then we'll do our main topic so we're we're chugging along here uh, MDI, MDI is happening, so we've got the, the Global Cup 2 this coming weekend, where we have, fortunately, eight teams that have completed all three time trial dungeons, which is very good news for me and Tells. I was a little worried that we weren't going to get there, but uh, last Just second, barely. we do Holy have an eighth team showing up shit. here, which uh, which is good. So here's, the, uh, here's those leaderboards. Uh, where we've got, there's a, quite a bit more, if you actually, if you compare this, there's there's been several teams now that have dropped out uh, or are no longer competing that, that were, had pretty good times in the last go round, uh, like the question mark squad, you may remember them, uh, aren't in anymore. Trell's and, team. Yeah, Trell's team. Uh, se several of the like ninth through 13th place Pieces. teams not going again. Pieces, who 
qualified but then didn't couldn't compete in the first cup. Uh, also not not going again. Um, but these top seven teams were all in last weekend and I have all queued again. Um, so yeah, that's the that's the situation we're looking at. Tattles, Dude. how do you want to start MDI discussion? Okay. What is wrong with like MDI qualifiers right now? Because th this is like historically low compared to what we've even seen in the past. And and I'm not actually sure what the problem is anymore. Is it is it time trials? Like, so, I mean, I, so Charles can speak to the time commitment part of, of practice as well, right? The fact that there's a, a long time trial window. I think one thing that is potentially worth considering is whether there needs to be a qualification period for each cup at this yeah. point. I think that instead something like a, a qualification period, even slash larger, more open tournament, and then a season of the eight teams that qualified for the whole season Dude. Uh, would may would maybe be a better way to to approach it. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. So so my my thoughts on it are, and Charlie, you can tell me why this is stupid because you have more experience with with at least qualifying than I do in more recent seasons. I think that the time trial should be on Friday, and they should do like some like weird ass time trial format to be able to field the top six teams, not eight. So that way, then we can go into Saturday and Sunday with the exact same number of broadcast days, and we'll do like a broadcast session on Friday where we're going over the time trials, like even in real time, if they want to still separate the the time trials out over three days. Um, and then we just go Saturday, Sunday with uh, main broadcast with the top six teams. I feel like that would be a little bit more reasonable. And it's like no, less practice time, potentially even no practice time, but they get like, I don't know, five or six hours on Friday to be able to slam through all their time trials. And then just like they take the top six teams and go into the weekend. I feel like that would at least be a little bit more reasonable. Well, the only problem with that is I like the short amount of time for time trials. I think that's good. Instead of five days, just about of time trials where people are incentivized to spend 24 hours every single day as long as they can practicing. Uh, that part's good. I don't know about the no practice time for the cup, though. I think I think cups should have a day or two. It's tough, right? Because anytime that you try tough. and enforce like a no practice time thing, the closer you get to zero practice time, the more you kind of require teams to then be practicing just indefinitely beforehand for all the possible things they might get, right? Yeah. So there's kind of this sweet spot where you want like enough practice time that teams feel like they can they can do some work and be efficient in it, but not so much that it's uh, you know an overwhelming amount of time. It's a really uh, difficult balance to strike. It's so hard to, to say what should be changed because this is yeah this is really common. Format's very similar to how it's been for years. It's, it's, it's a very common, going downhill. like, angst among uh, a lot of competitors, casters, organizers. There's a lot of people that are that look at it and are like, okay, something needs to change, but we don't know. It's well, hard to say precisely what it, it needs to be. Part of the problem, too, is that the viewership isn't bad and people seem right. to be enjoying watching the MDI. The competitors are not having a fun time competing, though. And sure, it could be alleviated by money, right? Like, obviously, you could throw a bunch of money at it and it would solve the issue, right? But that, I, I don't think that that's like the real. The, the money of the per viewership is in a pretty good place right now for compared to other esports as well. Uh, like the amount of money that, that's coming in per viewer. Um, I don't know. It's tough, right? Because yeah, yeah, you have these competing pulls of like, how do you make it more exciting for for viewers? How do you make it more you know good for the players? And those are often two things that are pulling in very different directions, right? Like viewers mm -hmm. would love like a, a pick ban phase with like wacky comps and different dungeons uh, with players, you know, total clown fiesta runs, right? And players would really rather not, you know, be uh, I, be in that kind of situation. I think I think that they should. I think that they should also change like how it's being done. I, I don't think that the you speed run only across 18s is like the real way to do it anymore. I think that you probably need people to, I think laddering up would be like going from like a 16 to a 20 would be at least more mm, interesting. And, and honestly it would allow teams that aren't practicing MDI as much. A Dude, the, they, they literally, what? they've done that twice before where like the, you remember when the finals was a higher key level than the rest of the tournament. Do you remember in like Legion when it went from like, 20s to 22s to 24s and the players did not like that they hated that i didn't mean laddering up like that i mean you it's an open it's an open tournament oh okay i mean it teams run simultaneously 
Like, okay, so oh, instead of two teams playing against each other, it's like the entire yes. team plays on the same map. Yes. Yeah, it's tough, that though, because, cool. like, that that's that has a lot of broadcast Not, challenges, right? Like, you, you need now eight observers instead of... Or 16 yeah. observers instead of four. Um, that's true. A bunch of extra uh, feeds and stuff. I, I don't know. It's... Uh, it's, it's i mean i think that i think that something needs to change though i think that it being stagnant is not going to yeah, be great i think so it'll be interesting it's it was really tough to identify things that have the best like bang for your buck in terms of things you could change that that would improve the the situation um i do think that one thing that the mdi is doing really well right now is that that level of competition among really the top two but even the top four or five teams is in a really good place right now i think mm -hmm. Um, the the quality of those games has been phenomenally good. The the amount of close games there were last last cup, and I expect there will be this cup, particularly between Echo and Perplexed, but also maybe with the new Golden Guardians team with all those kind of three through six teams, um, has been really good. And there there's there were a lot of upsets, which historically I think a big problem with the MDI was there were several cups where the higher seeded team, the better seeded team, won every single Just game. Won every single one. Yeah. Uh, and I I've... think that this time around, there there that not happening is is pretty good for viewership. Um, so uh, I'm, dude, okay. I'm sure. So I watched Legion I watched some of the Legion MDI matches on stream the other day, and I actually had so much fun watching them. I didn't realize why the Legion MDI was fun to watch, but it was fun to watch because every game was a fucking fiesta. And there was I you know, I thought that the Chinese team that got stuck on Rock Mora happened during the original qualifier. That was during the fucking global the global finals that they got. Is it really? The Rock Mora. Rock Mora. Yes, yeah. That was <laughs> and it's just like i think that that was what made legion mbi so much more fun is that literally every team and every single match was such a goddamn fiesta it made it a lot more enjoyable to play and enjoyable to watch it's tough right it you also, can't really you can't really put that genie back in the bottle right i agree yeah yeah Good job. just the novelty novelty of it was so nice and everyone was so excited and it was also new there weren't any set in stone teams like the top three or four teams we have now that are like you look at those teams as a new group trying to do the MDI, and you're like, all right, well, we're not going to beat them. Maybe we can try to get fifth place, you know, and is that even worth it? And that's one of the problems of teams trying to do MDI is that mindset. Um, yeah. It makes it worse that both regions are combined because there's not going to be a lot of new teams that can just roll in and compete with them right off the bat. The skill set for MDI is so different from live that you have to build it with the same group of people over time only doing MDI, and nothing else really contributes to that. And the other problem is that I think needs to change immediately is the time trials. The time trials need to not be four or five days. They need to be two days at the max. And every single person that's competed in the MDI agrees with that. So yeah. I think they are going to change that or something like I, it. I, I agree that, that that's like the, the biggest, uh, e easiest and biggest problem to solve, like in terms of uh, efficiency of, but I mean, of solving problems. That even then, the teams aren't. But teams aren't posting time trials, like uh, t posting time trial times at all. There was like only twelve teams that even posted a run, right? Well, but it's, it's still the yeah. de the decision well, to try and compete versus not is is made based on the fact that to be competitive, you need to use those five days, right? This this season of MDI is just like the perfect storm of bad things happening. Like it's time also trials. Just raid. Yes, yeah. It was released during a, a point in time where all of hall most of the Hall of Fame guilds were still progging on like the last three bosses. And so my team, for example, lost like 12 hours of practice time to four different raid nights during the first time trials. And then I also had my surgery, so we lost that, but that was irrelevant for the discussion. Right, that, that's not a... That, yeah. Bl Blizzard can't control when uh, when players' appendixes explode, but they can control yeah. when, the, uh, when the raid schedule so we, is and stuff. We had the raid release. This season also is the, the new target cap season, and then it's like, it's like no fun for MDI competitors compared to previous MDIs. Like... Previous MDIs, you could roll into a key with four or five classes that you know do big AOE damage and just like experiment and have fun. This time, there are like two classes that do good AOE damage. So you just have one person play that class, and the other two people don't get a chance to really do big damage. And that's like a big part of the enjoyment of MDI is the big pull, which are still happening, by the way, Blizzard. Even though you tried to target cap, people are still going to do big pulls. And yeah. then also, so they extended the time trials to start on Friday which locks out anybody that works on Friday. So I think you've identified a couple of different things there, some of which are just on the game dev end, where I agree there's a lot of uh, a lot of work that, uh, that has been done that regardless of the impact it might have had on plus 15s, which I, I, I still argue that the target cap hasn't been, 
has been neutral at best and negative i think for even there for most people yeah, yeah. Uh, I, th I think i think it also becomes like you become really bitter over those specs that aren't target like, i think people have real animosity towards fire mages right now because they're not target yet but like <laughs> fire mage has been so just fucking oh, salty F fire mage is also like they're coming off of Nihilotha as well, right? Fire Mages have just, were just like the most broken spec in the game before, and now they're for two patches in a row. They're just like but, clowning on people. I mean, dude, people are bitter about Wild Spirits too, though. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, that's the problem with a, a target cap that's applied unevenly and at you know different numbers for different specs. Is that it's <laughs> just, I mean, it, it's bad. I don't know, um, and I yeah so. I think that it's tough because when you look at the MDI, there's a lot of a lot of solution like knee jerk solutions that get proposed from just like borrowing from other esports, but there's not really any other esport that's like it, right? You know, competitive speedrunning is not something that you see as an esport anywhere else, really. There's there's not really any any direct um, analogs. The closest thing would be like like track and field running around in a like IRL that kind of stuff. You know, Tour de France, even th those sorts of uh, of time time based you know against because an environment of, i mean most of the time it's like an event right it's like a oh god what was that super mario 64 one that they did at the beginning of 2020 uh the well there's like gdq like awesome yeah there's also awesome games on quick, GDQ, yeah. yeah the all, yeah, all, all yeah, those GDQ. Um, but those are done th those are like one-off events where it's it's a lot less about the competition it's more just like exactly uh <laughs> the olympics know bringing up the against the environment well, part whereas here you're, well, it's really trying to make a pvp thing out of a pve format uh, and there's yeah, not really I, other pve esports of this type there was there was a there was one for like mario 64 but that i mean it, again it's an it's an event not an esport right it's right. Like a one -off, it's a one-off event it's like turning uh, the race world first from an event into an esport and it's not going to be like there's yeah if you tried to have weekly race to world first type comp comp competitions between teams uh, it's there are a whole host of challenges that uh, get out of there. I do think one thing that to look forward to though is there are going to be several like one-off weekend MDI experiments over the next uh, while that I think are going to are going to try and uh, break new ground and see how things feel with with different format ideas, uh, different yeah, structures. So, yeah, that, yeah, that should be good. I, I hope that they pull out some like wild shit and you're just like, yeah, and they look at they look at the MDI and they're like, maybe this is a better format for us. Yeah, because I think that there's. I could, I could see it being like a like a one week per season event where it's like the race to world first, and everyone just pushes as high as they can at an open bracket, like we were talking about earlier. But it's not like every two weeks they do the same thing; they just do it once per season. You know, I think that'd actually be pretty cool. Yeah, that was kind of our our push week uh, thing. We're trying to we're kind of trying to proof of concept the uh, yeah except, the, that sort except of coverage. Our day rate, except our day rate would be a lot better than, than the race or than our push week event. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that, that was not monetized in the slightest, which. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> shit hold on now that i'm really thinking about it <laughs> copyright it quick there's a strong argument we were losing a substantial amount of money doing that um uh, but was... you know whatever it's fun it's i think that it's popular as well which is cool yeah that would, that would be a lot more uh relatable to live players as well like the mdi is just so foreign to live players that's that's also one of the big problems i don't think we mentioned yet uh if you're a new player to the game or if you like mythic plus and you see the mdi you can't really go replicate anything because everyone's night elf. Everyone has mm -hmm. perfect classes, perfect gear, perfect conduits, everything. But you don't have the access to like any of that on live, or and also you just don't have the access to practicing the key. You have to just do it once and and play it safe. Dude, Dude so I'm so foreign. I'm glad that Echo's streaming. Yeah, that was really cool. That was really cool to see. Um, I, I I I'm I'm rooting for them this weekend because I want the team that streamed to uh, be rewarded. I want that to be uh, become a thing. Um, one of the most heartbreaking things for me about the MDI, actually, this is something that I thought the MDI did was really cool to see, was the Covenant stuff last uh, last cup. We saw like four different Covenants of Priest, uh, including like one player who played three of four different Covenants uh, of Priest, uh, two different Covenants for most of the other specs we saw, like besides Fire Mage and Hunter, actually even Hunter, besides like Fire Hunter Mage, I think we saw every other spec that got represented had multiple what different Covenants that people were hearing, playing. Weren't there? Who was? Wasn't Windwalker just Kyrian? Oh yeah, we're, okay. Windwalker was also just just Kyrian, um, and obviously Mage was just Fey. But every other spec that showed up had multiple different covenants being represented. And for me, the most heartbreaking thing is I thought I think that would be so cool to to bring that from the MDI to the live servers 
that like experience of uh choosing which you know which priest covenant which uh vengeance dh covenant you're going to play in each dungeon based on the strengths and weaknesses uh was such an exciting thing to think about and uh i wish that was God, the game. Yeah. you're so smart swapping covenants <laughs> is such a great uh, such a great thing i don't know why it's not uh, it was it was just so it was so cool to see um especially when like good players disagreed about which like if you think about how difficult a task it was to to land the covenant balancing in a pretty close band, you know, compare it to the specs, right? We saw very little drift in the specs uh, between between the teams. So obviously, there were some, but mostly teams were playing the same five specs. But they were often making three different covenant choices across those five specs as the other team. So uh, the balancing was actually so close that even in an MDI setting where there's really hyper intense pressure on picking the very best by a small percentage point people were coming up with different answers imagine if we got to make those choices when actually playing the, the actual game as well it'd be so yeah. cool that's another reason why it's so foreign uh-huh um so that's my bit make covenant swappable please let's move on to uh to the rest of our show so uh before we go on to talking about tank kiting as our, our strategy session this week we get to do our tip of the week segment my tip of the week is that the Great Vault, you may be surprised to get a keystone of a higher level than you were expecting out of your Great Vault. Uh, because it seems like it's calculated based off of your highest run of the season, rather than just looking at last week's now. So if anybody's been wondering why they've been getting higher keys than they, they thought they would be getting out of their Great Vault, I think it's just looking at what is the highest key you've done all season, rather than what is the highest key you did last week. Yeah, I think and, you're right. Okay, shit, that makes more sense now. Okay, Which so is it's cool. So if you have a twenty-one, or if you have a twenty-one done, it will always give you. It's a just 20. gonna, yeah, poop out twenties every week. I think. Again, I, I I've heard some slightly conflicting if, if evidence on this. I haven't uh, been able to thoroughly test it, obviously, but this is what it looks like it's doing to me right now. So. Uh, yeah, same here. Yeah, it definitely you, if, changed something. If anybody knows the actual algorithm, if it's different than that, do let me know. But that's my belief on how it works. That's cool. All right, Charles, what is your tip of the week? Mine has to do with a specific Mythic Plus mechanic. Uh, so there's these guys called Putrid Butchers in the Theater of Pain. And they try to cast Devour Flesh on the tank, which does a lot of damage and also heals the mob for quite a bit if it goes off. And right now with the meta being Vengeance Demon Hunters pretty much only and high keys, they don't have any tools to stop that cast. So the rest of the party actually needs to be aware of Devour Flesh and stun it in some way. You can't knock it. You actually have to stun it or disorient it. To prevent it, you but can it not range recap. this. I believe. I believe you can leap away from this, and it will uh, also work to stop it. Oh, um, really? you can misery. Okay. You can misery it if you're like seven thousand IQ. <laughs> okay. No, it's, it's it's undead. It's undead. You can't. You can't misery that. Yeah, that's uh, that a lie. I just made that up. Ah, <sighs> so dumb. Yeah, I guess leaping away if that works, that's the only way you can do it. I, I nice. think I've leapt this. I can't 100% prove it, but I, I believe I've, I've outranged it. But yeah, that's really good to do because it is such a big heal. That slows down the pull a lot. Uh, very good tip. And Trell now, or sorry, Tettles now, Tettles. we will look at your clip of the week, which comes from Gingy during, uh, during MDI time. So what what has happened here? So they've they've pulled Moizala and they have the enraged spirit up and he's like invis because he doesn't really want to pull the enraged spirit and he's walking away from the boss and uh, if you don't walk away from the boss fast enough, whenever it like instead of like taking the portal, like the obvious uh, other solution would be to walk away. But you have to walk like way faster than what he's doing. He dies to the instant one shot from the boss. Okay, so this is the shatter. The Shattered Reality cast, he didn't get far enough away from it when yeah. reality was being shattered. That's why you got to take those portals, I guess. That's why you got to get out of there. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, luckily, it looks like practice mode was on, so that was not a real attempt. Yes. Um, that is, that's a good thing to do. Uh, is that actually going to be a thing? Or are we going to see those Enraged Spirits skipped in the other side now? Because that, that seems sketch. That seems sketch, it's, given that they patrol on that, those platforms. Very sketchy. I, I I think that they. I don't know if they ended up being able to do it consistently, but I know that they tooled around with it a decent amount during. That's their so runs. cool. That th that is uh, some of the stuff that's that's really cool to see from MDI practice. Is uh, like even if it, by the time of the weekend teams end up looking pretty similar in routes, there's all kinds of cool stuff they try, and it's nice. It, it's actually really really awesome that Echo streamed and uh, and we got to see that from them. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I bet th- I bet they could skip the enraged spirits because even if they pulled them like a little late during the time they kill their ads, they could just shadow meld as soon as they get back to the middle, and it should be fine. I think in theory. Yeah, the problem but is they're that's, they're probably gonna murder. They're probably gonna murder him if he's on the platform. I guess it depends on where he is in the patrol. Maybe if it you also could depends on who it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah but too. you always can just assign uh, Jinji to go to the platform with the enraged spirit, right? Well, I mean, yeah. If you have like a hunter or a mage there, they actually can just like block turtle whatever during the rage cast if they, if they have it off uh and then like they have to obviously cancel block or turtle before they get picked up but that's basically it right and then they meld later but you also got to do a lot of damage to the uh the actual Mwizala image right well he'll he'll meld it off later right well, it, right assuming but the like healer's not getting combat you have a pretty tight dps check even on fortified which i think it is in that dungeon oh. this week yeah, maybe. Uh, that you're I, I don't think it's just sitting turtle or, or ice block, right? right? And, I and you also need you to could, avoid getting autoed, right? I, I suspect that you could probably just uh, uh, combust him and he dies, but maybe that's not true. We'll have to find out this weekend when uh, when Echo plays in the uh, in the MDI. <laughs> YouTube.com slash Warcraft. Very cool. Let's move on to our main topic, which is kiting as a tank. This is somewhat inspired by the fact that there was this huge hotfix designed to make it this less important. But I believe it still will be important, and I think it's just good to know how to kite as a tank, um, and how to help your tanks kite as a non-tank in dungeons. Um, so I think part of this it comes with planning as well, is just looking at a pull and identifying before you need to start kiting that you are going to need to kite. Uh, and this is a really tricky one for a lot of a lot of tanks. Will go in, you know, they'll pop they'll pop a lot of defensives, and then they'll kind of run out of defensives. And then they'll realize that they were supposed to start kiting five seconds ago, and uh, then they'll die. So trying to think five or so seconds ahead, trying to figure out, okay, how long am I going to have sufficient defensives to stay alive in this pull? And then if that's not going to last as long as the whole pull is, you know, I need to get out two seconds before all my defensives fall off, right? Uh, and start start getting out of there, um, I think is is a very important step, step zero for so- doing a good kite. Okay, so obviously getting out of the pack is really important, but like, what do you do if you're not like a Vengeance Demon Hunter with Infernal Strike? Because obviously Vengeance has it. Vengeance and Brewmaster Monk are probably the easiest since they have like Roll slash Chi Torpedo and Infernal Strike to be able to just like, yeah, effectively infinite mobility, right? But they can do it themselves. However, every tank has a way of doing it. They just, they usually need help from their group in some way. Like Warrior can either leap out or they can charge to a preset healer or range DPS mm-hmm. that they communicate with before. Uh, Bear can put down a type, can put down a vortex if they're rest of affinity or type in the mobs away from them and then start moving out if they're balance affinity. Uh, Paladin can horse away, but that's their only. <laughs> they, they can play <laughs> uh, so, they can horse away, get melee to the back and die while they're running away. There's some talent choices you're going to want to make as a paladin if you're if you're planning to kite. You can make slowy consecration that uh that will okay. help you as well, and you can yeah. you know, if you want to keep your threat, you can take blessed hammer. So that you you can keep doing actual damage in globals while you're kiting, uh, and avoid losing threat just as much, um, and that means you can actually kite a little earlier on Paladin than you can on a lot of other specs because so many of your globals continue to do effective damage while you're kiting. Um, but Paladin's actually pretty good at kiting once they get out because they can yeah they can they can use so many ranged attacks to keep throwing the mobs with consecration shield okay. shield of the righteous Avenger shield oh. a huge one Avenger shield what I meant to say yeah, yeah. Um, and then DK <laughs> just. Death and decay, and walk away from the mob. Yeah, so grip you of the use dead. Your, yeah, the grip of the dead talent is a ninety percent. So you got to use that really well to get out, or yeah. or communicate with your group with a stun. Mass grip as well can be used as often. Mass grip is is not used to facilitate kiting, but it can be. Uh, it's really potent for you can just mass grip onto the farthest back mob or onto a DPS player uh, and then run away. Uh, any of that stuff can potentially work. So yeah, having a kind of awareness of what parts of your toolkit help you start the kite can be really valuable. Also, just stuff like AoE stuns, you know, leg sweep, shockwave, um, or coming from your group. AoE stuns coming from your group can be the start of your kite as well. Yeah. Uh, any of that kind of stuff can be really effective. You really want to make sure you avoid showing the mobs your back when you're close to them, obviously, because uh, then you will get autoed in the back, and those are much more lethal than autos in the front for most tank specs. So, uh, yeah, it's actually a really good point. That. that becomes second nature eventually, but when you're first learning how to kite, you want to spin your camera around without turning your character and then leap backwards or something or or strafe away from the mob sideways instead of just going straight backward and risking getting one shot 
Yeah. But after a while, it becomes second nature. Like you always just want to face the mobs no matter what. So, so when do you guys use externals normally? Is it is it whenever you start your kite? Is it whenever you enter a pack? Like what, what exactly is like a general rule of like when to get an external? Like obviously, uh, Wrestle Shaman is meta, so fewer externals normally. But like, what what is like a general rule of thumb for those? Well, you definitely don't want to use it when you start your kite because that kind of wastes the external. Because even if you're a brewmaster monk, the external does not prevent stagger damage. So you have to you have to prevent the first instance of damage that hits you. So usually you want to use things like that that are outside of your control on on like a early basis. So as soon as you go into a pull, call for bark or sack or pi paint suppression ps. <laughs> call for call pi. For PI. <laughs> call for pi. Your DPS will love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, pi the tank so he can fracture more. Yes. <laughs> more threat. Thanks. <laughs> but, uh, so you want to use the external first so you have all of your own tools to use at the right instant that you need them because when you call for an external you typically need to wait like one or two seconds for the latency of asking someone across the world to do something for you yeah and then you use your own stuff after that <laughs> there's the couple seconds for it to for the, them to hear and then there's the couple seconds depending on who you're playing with for it to go through their brain <laughs> yeah. uh, whether or not they actually want to cast it on you um I think, yeah, using externals early, it do does depend a little bit on what spec you're playing. There are a lot of specs that are especially squishy on pull. Uh, so stuff like Guardian Druid, for instance, when you don't have your Iron Furs up on pull. Uh, and so if you, if you want to use your... Like, you basically have to use a cooldown either from yourself or somebody else on pull if you, don't, if you want to avoid just getting killed by the first three auto attacks of any what given pull. So we saw this in... You know, like, remember uh, when Dorky was playing Bear a lot at the end of BFA, a lot of it was like, bark me on pull every pull, right? Uh, at the as the you know first global going into each combat uh, was the strategy there. Whereas some specs, you know, prop warrior, if you're going in with avatar and shield block up, you probably wait for those things to be over before you you call for the paint suppression or whatever the the bark. Um, right, exactly. Yeah, it's different for every tank, but like the general guidelines is like use your external first. Sometimes even with your own defensive, and then mm -hmm. use your own defenses or kiting utility after that. Usually, when I play a, a slightly more a mobile tank like a bear, I'll. When I start cutting, I call for Binding Shot first if I have a Hunter, because it's the most consistent way to just get out of the pack and instantly stop getting meleeed. Like if you call for a ring, for example, as the first kiting tool from another player, then sometimes it'll take a little bit because they're casting Fist of Fury or something, and it won't immediately get the mobs off you. You kind of just have to wait. Yeah, I think also one factor to consider is how to make your kite as less costly as possible for your damage dealers, right? So something like Binding Shot is really good at keeping the mobs packed up, usually in the same AoE effects that they already were in, and in a predictable spot for the next AoE. Oftentimes if you're kiting, particularly if you're kiting packs that include some casters, some archers, uh, that kind of stuff, that can really cause the group to get all spread out. And that can really hurt your group's damage, which means you have to kite for longer, which means the kite might not be as successful. Uh, and whether you die or not, you're costing more time on a kite like that. So thinking about how you can use your abilities to keep things grouped up for your DPS players and ideally keep them in the same spot for, for 10 second bursts uh, is really yeah. good. So uh, something like this, something that people don't think about is like, should you be line of sighting this kite while you're kiting it? Or should you be staying in line of sight? Um, sometimes you, you want to make sure that you line of sight so that the archers actually run with the pack, right? Um, sometimes you want to stay yeah. in line of sight and then, you know, that, that way the, if the front mobs have a cast or something, they'll start casting on you and that'll let everything group back up. Um, those all can be important considerations that aren't so much about the survivability of the kite, but are just about making sure that the mobs stay nice and, and tightly packed. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and the group gains so much damage by the mobs being stacked for one, all the ground effects stay on the mobs and two, they don't have to worry about where all the mobs are and like who has threat, who's going to get hit by what. They can all see the mobs in one spot on their screen, so nobody has to think too hard about it. And three, it's easier for the tank to keep threat on all the mobs if they're all in one place. So it's like beneficial in so many different ways that it, it subtly increases the DPS of the group by like exponential amounts that you wouldn't yeah. normally just be able to see. And I mean that that's the importance of like displacement slows and stuns to be able to keep the mobs just like grouped up more. Like if you're playing with a warlock that has like sacrilash on and you're kiting a bunch, I bet the damage differential across the whole entire group is just like in infinitely higher than if he wasn't playing Sacralash, for example, right? Um, or like if you have Ursula's Vortex and you're using it proactively, it just like saves you a lot of time and damage, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's a a great a great consideration to to make as well. What about going back in? Uh, Trell, what, what, what is your belief system on when is it safe to go back in after you've decided to start kiting? 
You know, honestly, most of the time in, in Mythic Plus seasons, you reach a point where you just don't go back into the pole once you start kiting because it's so dangerous. Because you usually have to pull once keys get high enough, or some poles, even on like 15 to 16, are super hard where you got to use several defenses on pole. Sorry, my cat's going crazy. <laughs> that was too. <laughs> as soon as your defensives are done, you kite for the rest of the pole because you just can't live without your base mitigation plus a major defensive and a second defensive. So, like the the common strategy there on those kinds of poles is to run in for literally like four to five globals, and that's it. With your huge defensives running, do as much damage as you can for threat, and then you run out with some utility, someone stuns or something, bring a piece, binding shot. Ursals, and then you run in circles around the pack for the rest of the time it's alive, so that it's Thro all throwing your in the same area, <laughs> throwing your ranged abilities at them or whatever. Yeah, yeah, sometimes you're sort of like mini kiting where you're you're still somewhat in melee and you're still taking some autos, but you're like trying to eighty percent of the time be out of range of any given auto attack. Um, uh, do you want to yeah. explain like cir circling the mobs trail, like circle kiting, where it's like you're not getting melee by the full pack? Because we haven't yeah, seen so that in a while. So, like, areas where there's a big area, which isn't a lot of dungeons, this X-Pack, unfortunately, but, like, if you think of the first pull of Toldegore, last expansion, that's, like, the recipe for kiting pulls. Like, you go in for a couple seconds, you get out, and then you run in huge circles around the entire pack so that the whole pack stays within, like, a flame patch, a tar trap, something with a kind of radius on the ground so that people can do all their damage predictably. Yeah, that's a, a good way to make the most use of the space you have. Uh, absolutely. Okay, um, how does the rest of the group help the tank kite is, I think, an important question as well. Depending on what group you're playing with, kiting can be made a lot easier or harder, um, depending on what's going on. So uh, I think one underrated thing to think about is threat as well. Threat is a huge part of what makes a kite successful. So using abilities like misdirection and tricks is actually one of the best ways that you can help your tank kite uh, on, on a, a big pull like that. Uh, so I, I think that's one thing I want to I want to call call attention to immediately. Or Other than that, you could just have Kyrian sigil and drop it from range and do all of the damage. <laughs> that's a good one too. Yeah, having having range damage obviously helps as the tank. Um, it's I think important though, especially if you are playing with a tank that isn't Avengers Demon Hunter. You know that helping them in that initial stage where Avengers Demon Hunter would Infernal Strike, helping them create that initial distance using stuff like Typhoon uh like an aoe stun to allow the tank to then make that first little bit of distance uh, i think can be a really important way to help as a group uh, as a, a member of the group yeah definitely uh i think a big thing if you're just learning how to kite as a group or as a tank player or if you're trying to help your tank learn how to kite is marking the tank so that the group knows where they are at all times that's pretty important as well and once you see their marks start to move a certain direction then the whole party should know like that's where they're going to go for the first part of their kite I and think so you, one of the. Uh, I, I was gonna say. Sorry. I, I was gonna say. I think another huge thing is maintaining kicks from ranged. Like make, making sure, like the because the tank will oftentimes like facilitate the most important kicks in the pack. But like once he's out of the pack, he's not normally able to get his kick too. So making sure that you're continuously kicking is also really important. Yeah, I think yeah. another thing you learn as well when you when you start kiting is like, what weird stuff happens when this mob is being kited, right? Is it going to do a frontal aimed at the tank? Is it going to do a frontal aimed at the closest player? Is it going to do a targeted ability on the closest player now that the tank is out of range? Is it going to delay a certain ability until it is within range of the tank again? Um, all of these different behaviors happen on different mobs. And so it's kind of something that you need to learn on a mob-by-mob -mob basis. But my base assumption would be the entire pull is way more dangerous while it is being kited. There's way more stuff that can potentially kill you as a DPS player if you're standing next to it. So just be on the lookout for stuff going in weird directions that you need to watch out for while the tank isn't there. Uh, and then, of course, learn each mob's little bit as much as you can. Uh, in some cases, there's mobs that really incentivize you to not kite, but uh, you'll find ways to kite them anyway. Stuff like trees can be used against a lot of stuff that is an anti-kite mechanic. Uh, really effectively. So if you're playing with yep, a balance trees druid, those uh, not, the trees are just really good for kiting, anyways, because you can use them for ten extra seconds of making threat on pull. You can do all kinds of good stuff with trees, keeping them stuff in AOE while the kite is going on. All of that, uh, really, really valuable. So always talent that if you're in a, any kind of key where the tank is going to kite ever. Um, oh, it's something we should mention about kiting is that sometimes there's situations as a tank where you don't need to fully kite, but 
you should still get out of range of most of the mobs. And I mean, holes where there's a lieutenant mob that can't be kited, but there's also lots of smaller mobs that hurt quite a bit. So you can use stuff like Binding Shot to group all the mobs up right behind the lieutenant mob. So only the, the big mob is swinging at you at, at one point and not 10 mobs at the same time. So and you're taking like one tenth of the damage, but everyone is still doing full damage. You know, it's funny. That's actually really important for Inspiring. So Inspiring Presence works a little bit different than uh, Emissary of the Tides. Like Inspiring, whenever it walks back into a pack, it won't like completely break all the CC off the targets. Uh, the mobs will remain CC during the duration of it. So you can use things like Binding Shot and like Trees. Um, and then whenever the Inspired mob comes back into the pack, uh, the, the mobs will remain on those trees or on that binding shot as well. So it does allow for some more uh, kiting in a different way as well. That's very good. Uh, very good little nuance that matters. I think that's one of the things that most comes up with kiting is that you really do have to pay attention to all those little nuances of how the different stuff behaves. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, kiting can just be worse than staying in as well as an important thing to to be aware of. Like sometimes if you've got a bleed or a dot on you and if you start to kite and you're like going to range your healer or line your healer uh, there's often times where you're less you're less tanky kiting than you are just staying in and building resources and using defensive abilities um and i think that that is yeah. an important thing to be aware of on some packs it's just it's not going to work out if you start kiting uh or it, until the very end of the pull so uh, you got to try and save your your defensive cooldowns for those packs. That can mean that maybe the pull before those pulls, you kite earlier than you otherwise would because you don't want to fire off your Fell Devastation or whatever that lets you stay in uh, and you use it on pull on the next pull instead. Yeah, that's actually a good point. Uh, there's so many points in time while you learn dungeons that you're going to out, you're going to have to outrange your healer until you're on the same page with them and you play together a ton. So they know like what you'll do in each situation. But you have to choose sometimes if you're going to die to a bleed or outrange your healer. And that's like the worst choice. Because <laughs> yeah. usually you're going to die either way. But yeah. maybe if you kite, that'll that'll lead to further progression in the group because then your healer will know where you'd go next time. Yeah, I think that, uh, that you know, as much as you can communicate that you're going to kite before you start kiting if, if you're playing with a healer that you haven't uh, you haven't played with much before. That's a, definitely just a huge part of the, the tank healer synergy. And this expansion is so punishing because it is so important to kite. Uh, so you often are in that spot where if your healer's not ready for you to kite, you don't have a, a way that you live either way. Um, yeah, and, and also, like, if the pack only has, I don't know, what is 10 seconds left, and you start to kite, you can actually slow down, like, group damage uh, and make the pack go from, like, 10 to 20 seconds, too. So, like, if the pack is, like, very close to dying, you may just want to try to man up and, like, use uh, even like just call for a little bit more healing to be able to get through uh the last few seconds where you would have like a lapse in mitigation or be kind of scared yeah the, there is a often unknown external just saying heal me um uh, sometimes your healer <laughs> is just not spending a gold but maybe they're casting lava burst or something uh something crazy like that and you just yeah, you need weird. to cast healing surges on you uh and so, yeah, so sometimes when you say heal me you suddenly get a buff that you just like you heal 20 percent more it, it happens sometimes. I mean, just making your healer aware, because, like, healers don't always know. Sometimes the tank is at 80% health, and they're, like, dead next global. And sometimes the tank is at 80% health, and they're going to be at 75% health next global, right? And, like, a good healer can sometimes tell the difference there, but oftentimes there's a lot of different factors that a tank mm. is much more aware of than the healer is of what their life total is looking like and, you know, how, how much incoming damage they're about to take. So uh, passing that information along to your healer, making them aware of when there's ne there's going to need to be, like, 30 healing surges in the next 30 globals on you like there's a lot of healers that will be able to keep you up through that if they know they have to uh and so making them aware of it can can really help all right uh anything we missed about kiting here there's a, a pretty good information dump there i think that's a pretty good summary of it like there's no way to explain how to how to take care of every single pack with kiting because like we said every mob's different every mob behaves differently they have different move speeds they cast sometimes they are archer mobs sometimes there's so many factors. So just learn the mobs in general and then how to kite mm -hmm. them if possible. And then that's how you have to approach each individual pull. Yeah, and I think uh, as like somebody who's supporting a group that's kiting, whether it be the healer or the tank, utilizing your utility, not necessarily even just like your, uh, just like utilizing your utility to help them get away from the pack and make distance from the pack is normally going to be your best bet. All right, let's move on to the uh, the Q and A segment. But first, we get to thank our supporters over on the Patreon. They are Paul of US Proudmore. Soulbinds are just an underdeveloped dating simulator. 
Fukin in de Kukin. I hope I didn't say something bad. Oh, <laughs> you got you got, you got a lot more non-English ones in a second. All right. Um, delete DH. Deleting every layer eight Torghast elegantly doing homework. Gopher. Hi, I'm Mac, and I'm a balanced druid reroll because melee is cursed this tier. King of Skills. Zuko. Ja. I wish I was Ratnos' Dino Pillow. Chromed. Trekkie. The Marsh Hare. Regulus. Never Nude. Chewy. Tettles, aka the espionage trying to learn <laughs> EU's secrets. <laughs> um, ZimXX, Sinara, Red Ceratops, Necris, Revdil, Nevok, Sinmora, Eevee, Frosty K, New Meta. Frosty K got buffed. Maybe. Maybe True. it's time. True. Stevenson, an unnamed benefactor. Take Light of the Protector and Frenzied Regen off the GCD. Wobonesy No Verse. No Trick. I schedule a Tettles Flame. Sire Dematicus, GME, or Guardians Moonfiring Everything, Dimat, Syncope, <laughs> Gamer Dad in Training, 45, Supra, Lufer, I guess I'm a DH main at heart, Hanny is going to pump in Shadowlands, Drilling in the Kukin, Flick, <laughs> Kukin Der Kookies, Gallic, <laughs> uh, Brusif, Chewy, Dratna Shots Abyss, Mass's Spell God X, Dabrowski, M. Sanity. Please let my survival hunter have a raid spot. Also buffed. Rerolling Shaman to avoid having to get a Lust Pet. Pog Champ. Also buffed for enhancement. True. Um, Canyon and Moon Sonara of Emerald Dream Division 7 and Area 52 Scraw. And Xena. Thanks all for the support. Much appreciated. <laughs> um, at some point, I'm not sure if I want to know what I was saying, but we'll Apparently see. Apparently, one of those was fucking in the kitchen. Well. Now we know. Um, let's move on to Q&A. Q&A segment. We have a uh, first one comes from Jason on Discord who asks, how do you think Shadowlands dungeons compare with BFA ones? Is it still too early to tell? Yeah, I don't uh, know. It's hard to, hard to say that at the moment. I feel like I need a couple more seasons. Yeah, it is. it is tough to compare the end of BFA experience in dungeons where we had everything so, you know, memorized about how the dungeon worked and we knew all these intricacies of how all the different fights worked. Like you compare like season one, sky cap and crag to season four, sky cap and crag. You compare, you know, season one of all these different strategies we had in dungeons to season four. There's such a huge evolution. Um, I do think that the, the shadowlands ones feel a little bit more on rails than the BFA ones did. Which felt more on rails, I think, than the the Legion ones did. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of, a lot more pulls where there's really not too much creativity available in in route creation uh, for a lot of the Shadowlands ones. It, it feels like there's a lot of pulls where it's like, okay, look, this pull has four kicks and you know five targets, and so there, you can't really add another pull to this. Uh, this pull has like some uninterruptible damage thing, uh, so you can't really add any extra stuff to it. So uh, I feel like there's yeah. that, that's that's how it feels now, but. I don't know, maybe, maybe I felt this way at the start of BFA as well. This is the kind of thing where it always feels like you know everything and then you learn something new and you're like, oh, I didn't know everything. Well, so many things change too. Like, I mean, obviously this week alone, we had uh, eight to 10 mobs get nerfed in half with their tank damage. So like that just changes a lot of things alone. I'm sure there'll be a couple more tuning passes as the season goes on and it might be just completely different by season two, you know? I think so get, at I... least after season one, I'd, yeah. I'd probably say I could maybe compare the two. I think that at least the the seasonal effects in Prideful makes the dungeons largely more enjoyable. I think if you take the dungeons at face value, I don't I don't know if they're necessarily better. I mean, they're probably in my mind they're probably pretty similar. Uh, but just to me, I feel like Prideful seasonal effects is a lot more enjoyable to play, so it makes the dungeons a little bit more digestible. Prideful is nice. It does have a, an impact on routing where if you need your if you need to hit a twenty or forty percent breakpoint right going into any given boss. It does kind of narrow the field of possibilities about how you're going to path through a dungeon, right? Um, like, there's a lot of spots yeah, where, definitely. you know, it, it, there's theoretically a lot more possibilities in a dungeon, but then you're like, okay, look, I need prides on these three bosses. All of a sudden, there's only a couple of feasible pathways that accomplish that. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, I think prides are good yeah. ethics, though. I'm, I, I'm excited for it. But I'm also, well, you know, if the, I, I, I'm excited for the next seasonal ethics, too. I think seasonal ethics is their... Uh, are sweet. Let's move on to the next question from Ilotar in Discord, who asked, 
What would you do to increase the playability of the bastard child specs in the game, i.e. the survival hunters, demonology warlocks, etc., that never have a spot in the raid or M plus meta, and essentially turn the classes into two spec classes? I feel like melee specs are especially hurting in this department, as they are both the hardest hit by the target cap, and also have worse single target than the meta ranged specs. Well, I think we covered a lot of this earlier with the raid buffs thing. I think that would help. It does help buff. a lot of it. Yeah, a yeah. lot of those raid buffs. Um, that, you know, if if you list out the specs that never have a spot, it is the specs that don't have raid buffs that are that are included in that for the most part. Although, there have been some specs like Windwalker that brought a raid buff and didn't see play all of BFA. Um, and, well, in, in, in raid, it did see play in M+. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah. I think that... Some specs, just the fundamentals of some specs are really suited to raid, and other specs don't have those same fundamentals going for them as well. Uh, like, you have a spec like Affliction Warlock that just does good single target when it can, you know, good single target has a couple of good mobility options for itself and good mo movement globals and also does good, you know, multi dotting. And those yeah. are just the, the odds that that will be what a fight values is pretty high. And then you look at a spec that, you know, like several of these melee specs don't really have such a useful niche that they consistently fill versus, you know, stacking up against a raid boss. You know, I mean, you know, it's funny though. I, I feel like serve hunter and yeah. enhancement shaman right now in mythic plus are both actually really solid, uh, due to the amount of AOE damage they do, uh, their viability of getting into a raid boss though, is definitely substantially lower. It's tough as well because the, you know, if, if you're trying, if, if you're trying to be a, a, a player playing a lot of raid or m plus you probably especially if you want to do a lot of m plus you probably need to be on a raiding character right and so like mm -hmm. yep. you know the enhancement shaman are getting geared two or three months later they're not in those first couple of groups that's also kind of a hidden nerf to those specs in m plus right is if you're not good in raid uh you don't you don't get to play until you're you're caught up in gear as much um so i don't know it's it's tricky there's a lot of I think the melee challenge in general is just there's so few melee spots and raid bosses compared to how many melee classes there are, right? There there are more melee specs than range specs, but there are way more range spots than melee spots in, in the average raid. So you see huge representation of whatever hunter spec, whatever warlock spec, whatever mage spec is good any given tier. And again, even those classes have their arcanes and their de demos that are usually not the answer. Uh, and then, you know, so few spots to be split between enhancement, feral, survival uh even you know the death knight dps specs until they got amz um all that kind of stuff there there's just not not many spots to go around there that's just it's a really hard problem to solve though that one is is just how do you make melee good in raid is not there's not a clear answer that jumps jumps to mind for a good way to do that uh besides making them just do more damage by default than their range specs do which i i think is probably if i if i was if i had to try something i would probably just be like okay let's just Let's just aim the melee specs at 5% higher damage-wise than the range specs and see what that does. Um, I mean, we saw that in Old Deer. Yeah, but even then, that was a, that was a heavy range tier. It, well, I mean, all the all the melee specs did like 5-10% to 10 more damage. I mean, the bosses was, were just so bad. Yeah, I mean, uh, Cahoon and Mithrax, and Mithrax in particular, pre-nerf, was uh, horrible to bring multiple melee on. Because mm -hmm. yeah. you just have... That's the thing, is you, you make a mechanic that incentivizes you to spread. Okay, well, there's only so many spread spots near the boss. You make an a mechanic that incentivizes people to stack. Okay, well, wherever you stack, the hunter is doing damage. If you're not stacked right on top of the boss, the melee aren't doing damage, right? So the spread and stack mechanics that are most raid mechanics um, or like go to a specific, stand in a specific spot, range gets to keep doing damage when those mechanics come out and melee don't. Sure. It's hard. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know. I think that's probably what I do. I just, I just say, all right, look, well, there's a hybrid tax. Well, now there's going to be, I'm taking away the hybrid tax and instead I'm going to give specs a melee bonus. Five to ten percent more damage for being melee. And, uh, I'm down with that as a melee DPS player in raid. That sounds great. Yeah, I don't really have a dog in that fight. I, I don't play DPS this year, and before this, before I played tank, I played both melee and ranged. Um, so I, I'm just just trying to help make things more more even. Yeah, it's definitely a hard dilemma, though. It is hard. Yeah, and there's a strong case that whatever whatever change you tried to make to fix it would just make things worse. That's always. The fear when you when whenever you kind of spitball ideas on this kind of stuff is like, oh no, would this actually make the game way worse? So I don't know, maybe it would. Uh, all right, those are our questions for this week, and that is our show for this week. We will be back 
Next Hold on. week? Don't, okay. Don't sign us off. Uh, I think next week we, we want to do a little bit longer of a and a I think is what we were talking yes. about. So, the show, okay, right? Yes. Send us questions. Uh, these There have been great questions, but next week we might do like a long just Q&A for the whole show or something or like take a particularly good Q&A question or two or three and blow them up into 15-minute segments or something like that. So uh, send those in. The Discord is the best place to do it, but we'll look at Twitter and mm -hmm. DMs or whatever as well. Uh, in-game whispers if you don't if you catch us when we're not we're not busy you know we'll, Tattles would love to transcribe those and put them into the show notes so uh, <laughs> TTV Tattles on TTV Zul'jin Tattles Zul'jin. TTV Tattles on Zul'jin you can also find him on EU uh, but his character name is, is remaining a secret his identity is being it's not uh, being, even a secret he's, he's in he's in the uh, the NA player protection program over there so he's uh, you know he, we're shifting him around between servers on EU uh, and different names every couple days to, to keep the uh the EU police off of him. Anyways, uh, <laughs> all right, that's it. That's the end of our show. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys.